So today, we complete our journey. We have been journeying through the Lord's appointed times, through the feasts that the Lord declared as times and seasons. And through them all, we have seen that the Lord used these times and events for powerful movements of his overall movements on earth. And Benson was, was, was dancing over some of these time periods as we were hearing earlier. They've played important roles in what were, have been done both in the Old and New Testament. Today, we conclude our walk in the Feast of Tabernacles. Today, in fact, is the Feast of First Fruits. Last week was Passover. Today is the Feast of First Fruits. We're not talking about the Feast of First Fruits today. We will touch on it because the Feast of First Fruits is, of course, a pilgrimage uh, uh, festival, and it's part of the complex of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, the first of the pilgrimage feasts that were proclaimed by the Lord. But today, we do the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. You know, it was uh, Tolkien who said in The Hobbit, there were at the end of their journey, but as far as ever it seemed from the end of their quest. We get to the end of these feasts and it seems like, okay, we're finally through this. It's only taken like 12 different messages and we've finally gotten to the conclusion of it. But have we? Because some of it is yet to play out yet. You know, we arrive at the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh and final of the Lord's Days of Remembrance. And we've seen him use these feasts, and we've seen him do important things on these feasts. And he has done and will do important things on the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, um, the importance that we see in these often has to do with what Jesus used these feasts for and what Jesus will use these feasts for. Um, let's start first, though, with a reminder that Paul gave to us in the book of Colossians. Colossians 2, verse 16, states the following, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect to holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of... Christ. The body is of Christ. Okay, so these, these feasts are all a shadow of things to come when they were put in place. Um, it's important that we see these for what they have meant and what they will mean. Uh, the first of these days is the Passover, which happened earlier this week. Where Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, covers the entryway of each believer's being with his protective blood. And then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where Jesus, the bread of life, free from the leaven of sin, is offered to his family of adopted believers. And then we have today, the Feast of First Fruits where Jesus, the first fruits of them that slept, came and brought about resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Then we get, 50 days later, to the Pentecost. Pentecost, Jesus, who came to earth to initiate the harvest of all mankind through the work of the Holy Spirit through his disciples. Then we get to the fall, much time later, we get to the Feast of Trumpets, where the shofar sounds an announcement and the people are reminded of Jesus' enduring mercy that they're called together to celebrate and alerted that God is with us. Then, on the 10th of that month, the Day of Atonement, where all acknowledge their personal sinfulness and their inability to durably address this and complete dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ for our forgiveness from sin. And now finally, the final, 
the Feast of Tabernacles, also called the Feast of Booths, um, how Jesus revealed in this day that the followers were to hang out in temporary huts. Okay, so now how does hanging out in a temporary hut have meaning? Well, let's look closely at the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, the word that is used for tabernacles is Sukkot. S-U-K-K-O-T, Sukkot, which means booths, booths or little huts. And so these were to commemorate the time period of the Exodus where they lived in structures such as this when they were being taken from captivity in Egypt to the promised land. The 40 years Exodus that would not have been 40 years had the others other than Caleb and Joseph given a truthful report and, and had faith on the Lord's providence. Why is it that, jo that, that Joshua and Caleb had such a different report? Joshua and Caleb had been convinced by the Lord's actions all through their exodus th at that time that the Lord, there's no reason to say that he's going to stop this. He's done so many amazing things for us up to this time. Why would we be concerned about the next step? Because he's been faithful and true all the way through. So there they were. They gave their report, and the others reacted with fear out of what they saw as the possibility of success. You know, um, as the third and final and largest harvest festival... The Feast of Tabernacles represents a form of thanksgiving for the agricultural produce that they had been blessed with. And it was the produce of olives and grapes and corn. These are all fruits. Did you know this? I, I remember I was looking through this. I was looking through the, a thing on it. It was like, and the, the third festival is all fruits. And I'm thinking, wait, corn's in the group. Corn's not a fruit. So then I looked it up. <laughs> Go figure, corn's a fruit. Who knew? The covering of each kernel is actually a grain. The internal portion of every corn kernel is fruit, botanically. I did not know that. So, turns out, the Bible's right yet again. It's a fruit. So, olives, grapes, and corn. Spiritually, um, this festival commemorates the Lord coming to tabernacle or dwell with his people in their presence. It's also the occasion when Solomon decides to dedicate his temple. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 2. It's also uh, reminded by Kevin uh, a few months ago that this is when King Hezekiah commemorated it in 1, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 3. You see Feast of Tabernacles, uh, is present after the exile uh, uh, in Ezra 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 4, and Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 14. And this goes beyond just the Old Testament. You see the Feast of Tabernacles being represented in end times events in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 to 19. Just as intriguing uh, aside, it's likely where Christmas should have been placed. Think about that. Uh, this is probably where Martin Luther uh, should have placed Christmas instead of the winter solstice. And uh, if you look at Luke 1, 5, 1 Chronicles 24, 10, Luke 2, 8, Genesis uh, 33, 17, you'll see a lot of different references to tell you why that indication might be. Um, Jacob journeyed if you look at Genesis 33, 17, listen to this. It says, And Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. Um, so, Sukkot means booth. It's the same as Sukkoth. Okay. And we see that um, a reference being made to that. If you look in John 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh, and what do you do? 
dwelt. The word skinu, what's that word correlate with? Tabernacled. Okay, exactly. A tabernacle. Skinu is a tent or tabernacle. He dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory is uh, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thus, this, like uh, many other feasts, is a remarkable and important event. Now, this huge graph that I have up there that you probably can't read, it shows that if you follow through uh, on, the gra on the events, if you look up here where that's, that yellow line is, that's where we know that Zacharias' uh, uh, rotation occurred at the time of the birth of Christ, and that was during the uh, priestly rotation of Abijah. Interesting, if you look at the name of these rotations, these time periods, Abijah means Yahweh is my father. And then Elizabeth conceives shortly after that, and she is, conceives during the time period of he is saved or salvation. If you go six months after that, when we know Mary visited her, uh, Mary conceives during the time period of uh, Petha, Pethahiah, which means freed by Yahweh. Interesting. Um, then we know based on when Elizabeth was conceiving, she would have given birth during Iyar, the month of Iyar, and probably at a time of either dedicated or barley. Now that's really interesting that it's barley. That's an aside. I think I'm gonna do a message on that in the future, but it's kind of interesting that that could have been the time period. And then you know based on that if you go down to when Jesus would have been born, that would put it in the time period of Tishri, um, and um, it would have uh, basically been at about the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And seeing as he keeps using these feasts for significant events, it, it's plausible that he could have done that. We can't prove that. I'm not trying to say that this proves it. I'm just saying that the timing, we do know that, we do know hard, uh, hard and fast that Zechariah was during the time of Abijah. That, because the scripture says that. So we know that is a start time is hard. So if you go months down the line, the time period's about right. It's not during the winter solstice that he would have been birthed. It's about the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, that's just a rabbit trail. I'm gonna get off of that now. All right, so if we, uh, let's look to the scripture that describes the Feast of Tabernacles. We, if we go to, uh, Leviticus 23, verse 33, it states the following. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Seven days you shall offer made by fire, you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be a holy convocation, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, and a meat offering, a sacrifice, and a drink offering, everything upon his day." Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your free will offerings, which you shall give unto the Lord. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you shall have gathered in the fruit in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day there shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of the goodly trees, the branches of the palm trees, and the boughs of the thick trees, and the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. 
Another quick uh, portion of scripture that also deals with the Feast of Tabernacles, Deuteronomy 16, 13. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. And thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and their maidservant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow uh, that are in thy gates. Seven days shalt you keep a holy, a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord shall choose because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all the works of thine hands. Therefore you shall surely rejoice. Three times in the year shall all the males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks and in the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able and according to the blessing of the Lord thy God which he hath given thee. And then I'm going to skip to Deuteronomy 31 just to close this out. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of seven years, and in the solemnity of the year of release, in the, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is to come and appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates." that they may hear, that they may learn and fear, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord thy God and observe to do all the words of this law and that their children which have, known, which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord thy God, your God as long as you live in the land whither you go over the Jordan to possess it. You know, Benson led, led, the, led you verbally up to that crossing. What day did Israel cross over into Jordan? The Feast of Tabernacles. It says so in Scripture. Okay, so now let's, let me just summarize quickly what we see here in the Feast of Tabernacles in, in those various verses. First, everyone was to dwell in temporary booths during the feast. Okay, all of Israel. But we also see it's not just Israel that's participating in this. We see this in the Deuteronomy 16 verses that it was the stranger and the, the fatherless and the, and the orphans and everyone. Everyone who was dwelling was to participate in this. Okay. The first and eighth days were holy days of convocation. Okay. Um, there were daily sacrifices which were to be uh, given. There were a variable number of bullocks, uh, two rams, 14 lambs, grain offering, a sin offering, uh, and uh, offering of one goat. On the eighth day, it was uh, one bullock, one ram, seven lambs, a grain offering, a sin, sin offering. So in the whole week, 70 bullocks would have been offered. But what do we know from Hebrews? Do those 70 bullocks clean them and cleanse them of all sin? No. no, because not by the blood of bulls and goats do we get redemption, only but by the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, they had a ceremony, an outpouring of water that occurred. And it, this, this outpouring of water came from the pool of Siloam. And you're, you may... Uh, wonder, you know, how do you, how do we know this? Well, this is described in the Mishnah, and so the the, the actual the the how the rite was done, but it's important to know this because Jesus uses this in Scripture, and I'm going to explain this in just a second. Anyhow, as part of the ceremony, they had an outpouring of water. So on each day, they had a golden flagon that would sit upon the altar. And the flagon had no water within it. So in order to do the outpouring of water, they would do a parade. And remember how it said that they were to take the boughs of the goodly trees and the willows and the palms and all that? And they would take these boughs and they would hold them. Does this remind you of anything? Is there a certain thing that happened in Scripture where people are, are putting boughs up on the ground and waving boughs? It's Palm Sunday. 
It's Palm Sunday. So they would have these bows, and there would be a parade of the high priest down to the Pool of Siloam. Now, we know other things that happened at the Pool of Siloam. What happened at the Pool of Siloam? Okay, the Pool of Siloam was a body of water within Jerusalem that fed from the spring of Gehom. Spring of the river Gehom is important in scripture. It's one of the rivers in paradise. So when they are in the Garden of Eden, one of the rivers is the river Gehom. Okay, so this spring, the pool of Siloam is fed by the waters from the pool Gehom. They would go down to this pool of Siloam and they would pull from the water of the pool of Siloam. And then they would parade back, and, and there was something said, which I'm going to reveal a little bit later. The high priest would read a piece of scripture at that point after he's dipped in the pool of Siloam from Isaiah, and then he would go parade back to the uh, back to the to the temple, and they would pour this out onto the fire. There was more that was poured out. It wasn't just the pool, but the symbolism is when the water was poured out onto fire, it would, of course, create steam, okay? And so you'd have a column of steam that would rise up. We'll get back to uh, what was being celebrated there. But the reason that they did all this is they were commemorating that the water that was provided to the nation of Israel uh, during their exodus that came from the Rock of Meribah, okay? In addition to this outpouring of water, there was the lighting of the grand candelabra that occurred in the temple inner court and the torch parade uh, commemorating the guidance of the pillar cloud that happened during the exodus. The cloud by day, and what was, the, what was it by night? Fire. fire. Fire by night, cloud by day. And you see that in Numbers 14, 14. The, that that was done. And then in the seventh year, as I stated in that last part of Deuteronomy, the entire law was read. And we see this during the post-exilic time in those two verses that I referred back. They, they came back in from the exile. They read the law. And what did they do? They ripped their clothes because <laughs> they realized we haven't been doing any of this. And this is what we are supposed to be to have done. All right. So... Uh, I'm about to read a paragraph. I'm taking this from a D, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary professor. And I was going to put it in my own words. And I, I thought, you know, he actually worded it really well. So I'm just going to read his little segment because it's worded quite well. It's Professor Hall Harris III, um, who is an uh, Old Testament professor at DTS. Um, he says the following. The principal features of this observance in addition to the erection of the leafy bowers in which the people camped out and the offering of the sacrifices appear to have been the following. The people carried with them bunches of leaves called lulabs. There was apparently a disagreement between the Sadducees and the Pharisees over the correct interpretation of Leviticus 2340, and ye shall take you on the first day the fruit of the goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and the willows of the brook. The former, Sadducees, took the words to refer to the material out of which the, out of which the booths for the observance of the feast were to be constructed, while the latter, the Pharisees, held the, them to mean that the worshipers were actually to carry bunches of the trees named as they entered the temple. The Pharisaic interpretation prevailed among the people, and accordingly, each worshiper, as he marched in procession, would carry a lulab in his right hand and a citron in his left. Everybody know what a citron is? I had no clue. A citron is this fruit that looks like a lemon. Supposedly, it's good. I don't know. People who went to Israel, did you have any citrons? No, I see, don't see anybody. So who knows what a citron tastes like? Anyhow, they would have a citron in their left hand. The lulabs symbolized the stages of the wilderness journey marked uh, by different kinds of vegetation and the fruit of the goodly land that the God had given his people. 
as certain psalms were recited and, and worshipers shook their lulabs, the rejoicing was marked further by flute playing and dancing that went on for most of the feast and by bringing in young willow branches and arranging them around the altar. And you see this in the Mishnah Sukkah 4, verse 5. Uh, the tops were the, the tops thus bent over the altar, forming a leafy canopy for it. The reciting of the words, Save now we beseech thee, O Jehovah. O Jehovah, we beseech thee, send now prosperity. This is the psalm he was referring to, Psalm 118, verse 25. is probably to be understood as a prayer for rain and fruitful season. And, and each of the seven days of the feast, a priest drew water from the pool of Siloam in a golden flagon and brought it in procession to the temple with the joyful sounding of the shofar. Uh, there the water was poured into a bowl, and here's the important part. The water was poured into a bowl beside the altar from which a tube took it to the base of the altar. Simultaneously, Wine was poured through the similar bowl on the other side of the altar. The symbolic ceremonies were acted. Think about this. What's poured out? Water and wine simultaneously creating a column. The Lord led Israel through the Exodus time period. How did he lead them? In a pillar of cloud or by fire by night. What portion of the Godhead was in that, was it Jesus? Was Jesus in that cloud? Probably not. Was it the Father? Can't see the Father. So who was in the cloud? Spirit. So what do you get at this time period in this commemoration? You have the three witnesses to Jesus. The, the water, the wine, creating the cloud, the Spirit. That's why I did that last message on the water, the wine, and the spirit. Those are the three witnesses to the Godhead. That's why, that's why those scriptures exist in the New Testament. They're explaining this. I never understood this. And I'm like, oh, that makes total sense. Now I see the reason that those scriptures were so clearly stated there. It's part of the witnesses. I'd never heard anybody uh, elucidate all that before. Okay, back to what this professor is saying. Uh, da, 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 da. Thanksgiving for God's mercies is given is in giving water in the past days, probably looking right back to the smiting of the rock in the wilderness, and then on the giving of rain during the recent seasons. It's significant that the words of Isaiah were also with these ceremonies. Now, here's the part that happened when the priest is, high priest is dipping into the pool of Siloam. Um, he would recite uh, Isaiah 12, verse 3. With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. The Jewish Talmud connects the ceremonies in the scripture with the Holy Spirit. Um, why is the name, uh, why is is the name of it called the drawing out of water uh, because of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit according to what is said. With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. All right, let's just put this together. Let me just group all that I've just said there. Just consider for a moment that the spring of a Cajon, a river of paradise uh, from Genesis 2.13, feeds the pool of Siloam the well of salvation, to which Jesus sends the man born blind to wash and be healed. Man born blind, when he sent him, he sent him to the pool of Siloam. Jesus sends him to wash and be healed, and at the altar which you prayed, they prayed to the altar and commemorate that God is not just with them but in them. God's not just with them, he's in them. Now, this is the whole thing about the, pool, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's all about the Lord's desire to dwell with us. Why did, why was it in so important that people be given the choice to, to why does he plead with people 
to choose to follow him because he wants to dwell with his creation. That's how much he loves his creation. That's how much he loves everyone in his creation. He wants and desires to dwell with them. But he can't dwell with them if they don't accept his free gift. He can't, it's not possible for him. So he says, please follow this. I've, I've created a system. I've created a pathway where you can get right with me and we can dwell together because that's how much I desire each and every person to be in my family. It's kind of heavy and beautiful. Now, let's flash forward to the New Testament. Let's take this into the New Testament because the Feast of Tabernacles is seen in the New Testament. John chapter 7, verse 14. Now, about the midst of the feast, Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus went up into the temple. Now, remember what was happening here. This is near the end of Jesus' life. Um, the uh, disciples say it's the feast. It's time for the pilgrimage feast in Jerusalem. Jesus says, it's not my time. I'm not going to go. You guys go. I'm going to stay here. The disciples go up to Jerusalem, and then Jesus appears. And this is what happens. Now, about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory, being God's glory, that sent him, the same is true, and no uh, unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why go you about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goes about to kill you. Jesus answered and said to them, I've done one work, and you all marvel. Verse 25. Then, some, then said some of them uh, of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the leaders know indeed that he is the very Christ? Howbeit that we know this man whence he is, but when Christ comes, no man knows whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, and for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ comes, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? Going down to verse 37. In the last day, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But he spoke of, but this spoke he of the Spirit, which they uh, that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Because of that, Jesus was not, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Prophet, Christ, for Galilee, or Bethlehem? What was he? The leaders wonder why Jesus wasn't seized. Jesus then goes to the Mount of Olives. Think about this. Jesus, remember, you remember what is happening in this ceremony? That, that just, I want you to get the visual picture of this daily celebration down to the pool of Siloam where they sit there and they talk about, we will draw from the well of salvation for the Lord. <laughs> and then they go back and they pour the wine, the fruit of the vine, 
the work of human hands onto the fire and the water from the well of salvation onto the water and they see the column of smoke, the witness of God's presence with them. Can you imagine Jesus standing up and saying, if any man wants the real well of salvation, it is from me that comes that well of salvation. Doesn't that bring amazing meaning to these scriptures? When you realize what was going on at the feast at the time at which he was making this statement, he was reflecting back to the very giving of the feast to Moses and then to the people of Israel. It's a great irony that the Son of God was rejected when he came to dwell with man, even on their Feast of Tabernacles. Is that, is that not irony? The, very, the, the, the name of the very thing, the, the, very, the very feast that commemorates God dwelling with us, and that's when they're rejecting him. They were engaged in religious activity, but they don't know the Father or honor his word. The Jews were preparing to strike the stone which the builders had rejected, the one that is the cornerstone. Matthew 2, 21, verse 42. From which the living water could be supplied. They were parading around the temple with torches, but they didn't see the light of the world was standing right amongst them. Far brighter than anything that they would hold. The true light to both them and to the Gentiles. So, what do we see in these feasts? We have three harvest feasts. We see the Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks. Um, of course, the Feast of First Fruits is the whole week, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Tabernacles. What's the harvest? The first harvest is barley, it's a grain. Second harvest is wheat, it's a grain. Third harvest, we've talked about this, it's a fruit. Okay. What's the manner of separation for each of these? How do you prepare these in order for them to be used? Well, for barley, it's winnowing. So remember I, I explained this when we were going through the Feast of First Fruits. The, the barley is uh, heated and the heat causes the husk to open. And then the wind is used or fans are used to blow away the chaff or the husks. And then... How do, you, how do you prepare wheat? Well, it's called threshing. Threshing. And, you know, threshing is a far more violent uh, activity. This is, you have to basically beat and uh, crush uh, wheat in order to get it separated from the straw. It's a far more involved uh, thing. And what happened on that feast of first fruits? Well, that's where Jesus was resurrected, okay? Now, during that week, you have him, the true first fruit of mankind, who came to save and provide. But what happened during the Feast of Weeks at the, at the time of Pentecost? We see the Spirit coming down to dwell with those that believe, okay? And the law is also given to Israel on the Feast of Weeks. If you look at, you do the timing from when they left out of Egypt to when they get to uh, Mount Sinai, the law was delivered to them. So what do we see in that? What did the law do? The law told the people of Israel, you can't in your power follow this perfectly. Okay. I want you to follow this law because it separates my people from the world. You are to be holy. I am holy you are to be holy. Follow my words and follow my commandments just as I state. And I've given you a law. But people couldn't do anything with that law because they couldn't follow it perfectly. What did it show? It showed that they needed something more. They needed something more. And even those that had the spirit within them, that spirit which is capable of purifying and threshing them, you know, what, you know what the Latin word for threshing is? It's curiosity. Tribulum. It's tribulum, from which we get the word tribulation. 
threshing, the threshing of mankind, okay? But you needed more because you can't dwell with the Father in an unholy state. How do you prepare any of these th fruits? It is the wine press. Olives are pressed. If you're getting corn oil, it is pressed. Okay, it is from the, and the verses right after Benson was, was walked right up to those verses where it talks about, uh, Jesus talks about the, the wine, the wine press is about to occur. You will be pressed because in that pressing and in that crushing, that's where the wine is produced. This was also the time that they came across the Jordan. I've spoke of that. Okay. Um, if you look at uh, Matthew, Matthew 3, verse 11, it says the following. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. This is John the Baptist talking. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat in to the garner, and he will burn up the chaff which, with an unquenchable fire. He has the fan. You'll be winnowed. He has, he will, he will crush and he will thresh, and then he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Is there any burning that goes on at the end? Well, of course there is, and we know that. What happens at the throne of judgment? Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3.13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. For those written in the book of life, this will be their experience. Those not written in the book of life will experience that fire for eternity because that's what the Lord has deemed that it would be. There, there, are, there are harvests, harvests that have occurred. We've seen the first harvest that occurred when Jesus was resurrected. The graves were opened and many were seen. There was a second harvest that started on Pentecost. It has been going throughout the entire church age. And then there will be a third and final harvest that will occur. It'll be in the end times and there will be, and there will be the end gathering. Okay? It is a pattern that goes through justification that comes by the blood of Christ through his sacrificial work. There's the sanctification that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit given at Pentecost within the life of believers. And then finally at the end times when we are gathered together, when John says in Revelation that I looked at the temple and what did he see? There was no temple for the Lord, the Father and Jesus Christ were the temple, the tabernacle, at which time we'll all be glorified. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we look into your scriptures, it's fabulously complicated. It's also beautifully simple. It's deep. It causes us to uh, revel exactly how beautifully you set everything up and how you use all these minor details which we sometimes skim over when we're reading your words, missing all the symbolism that you poured therein. Lord God, you are beautiful in every facet we look at. Your ways are true, they're right, and you are faithful to us, providing at every juncture. Lord God, that we would see and trust you, that we would not doubt that your provision will come in the time of trial. Lord God, that we would be that beacon on the hill. We would be that bright light reflecting your glory 
and that our every action may lead to the glorification of your name. These things we pray for in your blessed name. Amen. Amen. Amen.